Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the XPX panel, How Drawings Resonate, Empathy and Identity in Graphic Memoir. Today we'll be asking, how do comics artists and writers render hidden or painful experiences in a manner that resonates with readers while also realizing their own vision for the stories they want to tell? And we'll discuss the ways that audience, reception, and relatability affect how comics are created, particularly those by women and people of color. My name is Kiana Witted, and I'm delighted to introduce today's conversation with G.V. Tran, Aaron Williams, Jeanette Roan, and Kay Sohini. Along with being a professor at the University of South Carolina, I'm chair of the International Comic Arts Forum, or ICAF, a conference for academic scholars in comic studies from around the world that was founded in 1995. We're co-sponsoring today's panel um, of course, we had hoped to do so in person, uh, but we'll also be hosting our own virtual forum starting in mid-October, featuring the best of comic studies scholarship through video panels and online blog posts. As always, ICAF activities are free and open to the public, so we hope you'll join us online next month. And you can visit internationalcomicartsforum.org for more information. I'm gonna start things off today by introducing two terrific scholars and friends of ICAF. And after I introduce them, they are going to offer opening remarks about our two incredible artists who we've invited to join us today. First up is Jeanette Roan. She's an associate professor in the History of Art and Visual Cultural Program and the Graduate Program in Visual and Critical Studies at California College of the Arts. Her research lives at the intersection of visual studies Comic Studies and Asian American Studies. Her first book, Envisioning Asia, on location, travel, and the cinematic geography of US Orientalism, was about film. But the next one will be about comics. And she loves talking to cartoonists. So welcome. Next is Kay Sohini. Kay is a comics maker and a PhD candidate in English at Stony Brook University. She is currently drawing her doctoral dissertation as a comic which is an ethnographic project about race, gender, sexuality, and illness politics. Recently, her work on comics has been published in Essay, a journal of nonfiction studies, Sequentials, and is about to be published in DeGruder's Handbook of Comics and Graphic Narratives and Penn State University Press's COVID-19 Anthology in 2021. Earlier this year, she received the Edward Giuliano Global Fellowship to fund the field work for her graphic project, resistance during the fall of the world's largest democracy that aims to look at the resistance movement against rising xenophobia in India, which has been exacerbated in the wake of COVID-19. And Kay is also secretary of the ICAF executive committee. So welcome, Kay. And I'll let Jeanette take us into our next segment. Thanks. Thanks, Kiana, and thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, it is my honor to introduce G.B. Tran. G.B. Tran is an Eisner-nominated cartoonist and author of the graphic memoir, Vietnam America. Included by Time Entertainment on its all-time top 10 graphic memoir list, it also earned the Society of Illustrators Gold Medal for Sequential Art and New York Foundation for the Arts Gregory M. Nonfiction Literature Fellowship. Since self-publishing his first comic in 2003, the Zarek Awarded Content, his stories have strived to use comics idiosyncratic language as a vehicle to explore memoir and memory. An adjunct professor at the California College of the Arts, GV's teaching draws from eclectic approaches and processes from his work as a designer and a cartoonist. In recognition of the latter, he was awarded the Civitella Ranieri Fellowship in 2016, the first cartoonist to be selected since Alison Bechdel. Not bad company. Thank you for joining us, GB. Uh, so I will get things started off with a question. Since we're talking about audience and empathy and identity, your book tells a story of your family's history that is really different from a lot of existing narratives about Vietnam and the Vietnamese in the US. Uh, how did you think about engaging readers that might have a very different idea of what Vietnam and the Vietnamese were like, as well as potentially readers that have a very intimate knowledge of that history and their own sort of stories about that um, background? Uh, ooh, that's an interesting question. Uh, 
I mean, not to pull back the curtain too much, but I actually didn't really think about that when I was writing Beat America. <laughs> I, yeah, because I mean, Beat America is it's just a, such a very personal story. I mean, there I can say there was a moment when I started kind of uh, working on drafts and how much of the historical context to actually be on the page, what was going on, to be like, oh, right, if someone reading this is like me and they don't really know what the hell happened during the war, then maybe they would get benefit from knowing some things that happened, just like historical landmarks. So they know like, oh, why, who's fighting her, et cetera. Uh, but the more I got in, I actually literally started re reading like Time Life's like, or Time Magazine's books about the Vietnam War, those 30 volume sets. And, I quickly kind of glazed over and was like, this is not what I want Beat America to be about. Um, and um, to me, like, I honestly, uh, yeah, it's an interesting question because for me, like, it was more like, at a certain point, I realized that anyone reading it would probably not be reading it for like historical context or just speaking towards that, that framework of like, you know, this war in another country and the cultural differences and stuff like that. Um, but more of just like the story of this child growing up and learning about this entire assorted past of their family. And that's the way that I wanted, hopefully that it would resonate with the audience as opposed to being like, and this is what life in Vietnam was like growing up in the seventies and the eighties. And this is what life was like growing up in South Carolina in the seventies and the eighties, which I mean, obviously are very big parts of the story, but never, hopefully I don't think in a way that's like, that's the most important part of the story, but more of just like a background for all the internal family stuff that was going on. So. Great, thank you. And my apologies, I realized that we were supposed to go to an introduction of Aaron by Kay next. I jumped the gun a little bit here. So my apologies, I'm gonna turn things over to Kay. Oh, Kay, you're on mute. Thank you for letting me know that. Um, so we also have with us Erin um, Williams, and she is the author and illustrator of Commute and Illustrated Memoir of Female Shame. And she's also the co-author and illustrator of the big book, uh, big activity book series. She has over 10 years of experience in data analysis and scientific research. As he's, she's also the co-author of several academic studies on racial disparities in cancer care. She's currently working on a book of graphic medicine about women and non-binary people who suffer from chronic chronic pain and illness, and the structural foundation of American healthcare as fundamentally patriarchal, white supremacist, and transphobic. Um, so glad to have you with us here today, Erin. Um, Thank you. So, so my question to you um, is about commute. Um, so overall, or at least on the surface, um, your work is very stripped down. But you also use a lot of deeply contrasting elements. So in particular, the sharp contrast between created between alternating between race and spattering of color, or the tension created when you switch from uh, sparse line work to more rendered scenes, or when you use like realistic proportions and then move to anatomical distortions. It makes for a very um, raw or even jarring reading experience, or at least the way I experienced it, uh, it kind of like mirrors the traumatic content of your work very evocatively. So I was wondering uh, when you were kind of like, kind of like working out your drawing style or when you were like first starting to draw commute, did you at all have the effect of effect on readers on in, in, in mind or if it was just like a byproduct of what you were doing? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I can definitely tell that you guys are comic scholars because you ask really smart questions that give me as a creator like way too much credit for forethought. Um, so yeah, I, I also sort of have to confess similarly to what JV uh, to what GV just said. Um, um, I had no idea what I was doing when I started working on Commute. Um, I had been illustrating these uh, activity books and but I didn't think of myself as an illustrator and I'd written um, the text of what became commute uh, in the notes app on my phone on my way to work and back because I was having these sort of <laughs> it was really triggering for me just to to walk around with a lot of unresolved um, shame and and trauma from um, sexual assault that I hadn't really dealt with from when I was drinking and 
now I'm sober and I don't want to bore everyone with my life story, but um, a friend of mine who's a writer said, why don't you make it into, because I didn't know what to do with it. I was just literally going to Xerox it at Kinko's and like give it to some of my friends. And um, my friend who's a writer said, you should make a graphic memoir. And um, I, had never, I had never read one. Um, so I, I read, um, I read Fun Home. It's a good place to start. Um, and I sort of read more as I was going through, through the process, but, but honestly, like the style that it was drawn in, um, is reflective of the experience that I had in creating it. Um, and, and also like the things that are different about it are different because I just didn't know a lot about comics and how people had done them before me. Um, it's something I've read a lot about since then. I've read a lot of graphic work since then and, and comic scholarship and um, I love all of it. I've become really invested in it, but when I started to commute, I, I just didn't know. And so I think like, I mean, the only other thing I want to say about it is that um, like some people think that making work like this is like, like I've gotten the question a lot, is it cathartic to make a work about your trauma and your shame? And it is not, or it wasn't for me at all. It was really re-traumatizing to live through this again in a really visceral way. And you spend all this time drawing the scene of like your own um, rape or assault. It's like, it's not, it's not cathartic. You're there, you know? Um, so I think it's jarring because, and the choices I made were jarring sort of unintentionally because it was a really emotional experience for me. Um, a lot of it is really like stripped down and simple, maybe because I just wanted to get to the next page. Right. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't think it was specifically intentional. I just, it was a combination of, of those things. <laughs> Thank you. Can I, can I say something about that? So I, I think it's really interesting the way you describe how that took place for me because like you worry about like, oh, these are just the notes that I was writing during my commute. And then it wasn't until like I shared it with a friend that, you know, this, this possibility came up. Because it's similar to in America, like I, I was just writing notes for my first trip back ever. And with all these things came up and it didn't really occur to me until I met someone and they basically posed me a simple question, which had seemed like it had the same impact that it did for you. Was they were just like, if you could only tell one more story in your life, what would it be? And I was like, oh shit, it's this. Even though I never thought about it or wanted to do it, but it is clearly this. And it sounds like a similar kind of like light switch went off for you when you actually shared that very personal, you know, early work. Yeah, I think. I mean, my my reason for for starting to write it to to begin with was really just like it, I wanted, I I just wanted to take this stuff and like put it. I wanted to take all of this internal stuff and make it external. Like I I wanted to like take this and be able to just put it on a shelf somewhere and and say like this this is outside of me now, like in a really sort of visceral way. Um, If I could follow up on um, both of those really interesting responses. Um, so Aaron, you were talking about not really knowing what you're doing. I think for both of you, these projects started as very personal projects to sort of work through some stuff in your past, your family's past, your own past. Um, and I'm wondering, the question that I posed to GB for you, Aaron, did you, at the point that you decided to make it a graphic memoir, did you think about potential audiences and where they would be coming from in terms of what you wanted to share? Um, part of it, you know, is the really stripped down drawings, right? Like, I feel like there's, um, there's a sense of withholding right? because there's so much about appearance and about visibility in your book that in a way you didn't want to give too much to the reader of what you look like. Your face is very recognizable throughout, but um, so much of the, the way that you draw yourself is very minimal and very abstracted. So I'm wondering if that's partly about this story, this sort of all of this trauma that you're working through now, you're going to be sharing with the world. How do you then rethink that process of sharing? Uh, it's a great question. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I think when I, I think I love the idea of 
like I, I draw myself the same way wearing the same things in every page so it's like a white t-shirt and black pants and I don't have any tattoos in there even though I have tattoos in real life I because I wanted the the present moment and the flashbacks to feel like they were happening to the same person because the thing about black DSD um, is that it, it is present like you really, you know, it, it feels really present. Um, and I think I also have this idea about wanting to be like a specific woman, but also a representative one. Um, although I think some of that was misguided because um, one of the things that I don't address in commute that I regret not addressing is all of the ways that this experience is, experiences as traumatizing as they were were privileged but also like they were representative of you know a white woman growing up in the suburbs who um you know was well i mean it, they weren't it was not a representative experience necessarily it's representative for for some american women and then they're honestly the most the ones that are sort of the loudest uh, in, on a national scale in the Me Too movement or whatever. So I think there was some, uh, that was certainly a, like a, a, a blind side for me. But I, I think I thought that by, I liked that like that sketchiness of the character that, that I was hoping someone could see themselves in there or a man reading it w might be able to picture someone else. Um, yeah. That's great, thanks. Um, I think it definitely wor worked because um, as somebody who grew up in South Asia, um, I could totally like empathize with your work. And it kind of like made me think about um, Scott McCloud's theory of if you draw comics like really simply, like not put much details in there, people will identify more with it. It's not necessarily true, but um, I think it worked out in your case, like um, kind of like, yeah, it was very identifiable. So. Yeah, that's, that's actually what I thought about when she was talking about that too, was that Scott McCloud sliding scale of iconic representation versus yeah. like literal representation. And that the closer you get to the literal, the less it's likely that the reader is going to be able to identify with the character because they're like, oh, well, I'm that bald and Asian and 43 years old. I, that's not somebody I can imagine. Or, you know, vice versa. But yeah, I think that like the simpler line work, you know, mm -hmm. that, more more expressive is allows for the audience to you know put themselves in the the, the character's shoes more easily uh, i'm so glad i started reading that book last week because i know what i'm talking about <laughs> fantastic i teach it every semester <laughs> yeah but absolutely the iconicity of the character, I think, is definitely this uh, question of point of identification. And I agree with Kay, like, it doesn't always work, right? Um, I don't think that every reader identifies with every iconic drawing. Um, but I think that in contrast, I mean, GV, for your work, I'm really struck by how detailed the backgrounds are, right? So um, I think, you know, in Aaron's work, it's very spare, like, you don't necessarily, except for, like, the New York City, the sort of buildings feel like New York City. But in your work, it's so specific, right, in terms of background. So on the one hand, there's the um, kind of identifiability of the main character, but then you actually have um, very much a, a very specific detailed background that you're sharing with readers. Uh, yeah, I mean, especially, I mean, certainly in Vietnam America, and I think in a lot of my stories, actually, I do spend a lot of time focused on the background because I consider like the background, like the visual background on the panel, the scene is, is another character, essentially, especially in the fact uh, for Vietnam America where I depicted Vietnam through the ages, um, and also a little bit to the, the states through the ages. So it's really important to find like these key images where you see a certain type of car, something that really kind of puts it in a decade, or certain type of you know, like colonial architecture versus like modern architecture. Because yeah, and also, I mean, I I, I grew up. I don't grew up. I still read a lot of manga, <laughs> uh, and you know this this whole process of having these extremely like for, for, I think a lot of people who might know this already, but with studios and a lot of time the artist is just drawing the main characters and then it's a studio that then fills in the background for them, right? So one of my first 
earliest work that I'm talking to was Akira, which is in Spain as far as architectural like creation and stuff like that. And to me, it really did, at least for me, it really does ground, help ground the story in a, a really concrete place. So in a weird way, it does the opposite of what we're talking about, the iconic versus representational, because I feel like I draw my characters pretty abstract iconic, you know, two dots for eyes, like exaggerated expression, pretty simple brush line. But then, so hopefully that the reader can see themselves in the character's shoes a little bit easier. But then I put it in an extremely uh, try rendered place because then that hopefully makes that place that much more realistic to it to the reader and be like, oh, this exists in a time and place. Um, and, and, yeah, just the contrast, the juxtapositions, right? Like even storytelling, it's all about juxtapositions, right? Contrast, and that's where you get the you get more things for your, your story. <laughs> Um, speaking of GB's background, can you speak a little, a, a little about the the one towards the beginning of the book where you kind of like combine Vietnam and New York? I think it's New York because I can see Empire State in the background, but the foreground doesn't really look like New York. Yeah, that's the one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So just the audience know, we we were asked to have certain pages bookmarked. It's not like I have that right beside me at all times, ready to just share with people. <laughs> um, I, yeah, no, that, that spread was actually drawn. That was one of the last, uh, out of the 300 page book, that was one of the last, if not the last thing that was drawn in the book. Um, I always knew that it was going to be there uh, as a transition for what happens in that story right at the beginning. But the actual physical contents of it, I didn't know until I finished the book and I'd drawn you know, 288 pages of various places and environments and buildings and homes and schools and hospitals and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and when I had all those physical, visual environments in the book, uh, I mashed them all into that page, basically. So yeah, it's a combination of New York. You'll see like the, the house I grew up in Arizona, which is recognizable in later chapters. You definitely see landmarks in New York. You see like my apartment that I lived in New York. Um, you see, uh, and then you'll see a lot of places in Vietnam. But it's the idea of like, and that spread occurs in the story where I'm basically uh, going back to Vietnam for the first time. Right, yeah. I should technically say going to Vietnam for the first time, not going back to Vietnam because I've never been. So it was a moment for my character just to be like, oh, just kind of foreshadow everything that it was about to be revealed or explored in the rest of the story. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I think that that particular two-page spread is also interesting because it also foreshadows the way that you, you use place to move through time. Mm -hmm. So then partly it's about physically traveling to Vietnam, but then learning about this whole sort of family history. Um, and I wonder either for you or for Aaron, because I think commute functions similarly, right? And that the, the travel through space, the commute from is it, it's Westchester to, to New York City and then back, right? That's kind of the... Um, temporal space and the physical space, but then you go back in time. And I was just wondering whether either of you had anything to say about this idea of journeys as a structuring sort of narrative framework for your work. Like how do you travel through time and travel through space, right, on the, the sort of page, but also throughout your entire book? Okay, sorry, that was a super complicated question. <laughs> time, oh. space, comics, go. <laughs> And maybe I'll just add memory to that because I feel like time, space, memory, like they're just, mm -hmm. you know, like creating each other in both of your work. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Um, um, yeah. I mean, in some ways, the way that you describe how commute came about is sort of that very process, right? That you're yeah. on your commute, and then there are these things that are triggering memories for you. So in some ways, the structure of the book mirrors the structure of your experience. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's exactly right. Um, and commutes are generally really boring, right? So you have lots of time to think, and you're also interacting with the strangers and things going by. Um, so yeah, it was, it, it, it triggered a lot for me. And I think, you know, I already said this, but m memory feels really present when it's, 
right in front of your face. And, and flashbacks, trauma sort of function like that too. Like you, you sort of, you get that visceral like shame hit in your stomach that um, sort of stops you in your tracks. So I would see a, a guy on my commute who looked like a guy that I had, you know, had sex with 20 years ago and I'd be like, oh, um, so yeah, but it was, it was interesting sort of in the process of creation. I had a lot of uh, conversations with my editor who wanted like what we ended up doing is the, the present tense is sort of drawn this way with no borders and then, oh great, I opened to this page. Um, this, uh, this border we used around the pages that are memories um, right. to differentiate um, the present tense from a, a memory. But I was sort of opposed to doing that for a long time because I wanted you just to get lost and not really know where you were. Um, whether it was happening today or happened 20 years ago, like it all feels like right now. Um, but I lost that fight. And I think it's easier to read the way that it is. I'll give it to um, you also do not use panels. Um, was there any particular reason behind that? Because the first time it works perfectly, because the first time I read, I was so emotionally immersed in it. I did not notice that at all. Like I had, I completely like kind of like glossed over that. But then I was writing this review for the Comic Study Society's blog of, of your book, which you probably saw like, it was then I was like, okay, this book does not have panels. And I was like, yeah, that was kind of like surprising because like, you know, like that's one of the basic like essential parts of sequential art, like it has panels and yours didn't. And it was still like distinctly a comic. So I was like, just wondering like, what kind of prompted you to do that? Yeah, um, well, I will tell you. Mm -hmm. um, I had only read one comic book and it was by Alison Bechdel. And I was like, well, I can't do that, you know? <laughs> Well, I don't know. I didn't know what I was doing. And um, when I de I'd done these like activity books and they were all, um, they're all like, you know, one page. Um, so I just did what I knew how to do. Um, and I don't know, I think in pages and, you know, if comics are if they call it the sequential art, right? It's like pages are sequential too. I don't, I don't know. I sort of think in pages and even with the, the book I'm working on now, which has a lot more text, um, I, I'm working in pages. I, I don't know how to do panels. It seems hard. <laughs> it takes a lot of time. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you should, maybe you should. Panels now for pages as well. <laughs> yeah, GP, do you have thoughts about panels, for or against? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I think it's really interesting what, what I was saying because to me, like, as a um, cartoonist, I do always consciously try to tell my story in a visual way that I feel um, keeps the reader, can keep the reader engaged, um, right? So whether it's, like, trying to change up the panel sizes or the contents of the panels, not making them too repetitive, etc. I think uh, what Aaron is doing is really interesting because by having like this kind of splash image on every page, it's interesting because at a certain point as a reader, you get into that rhythm of like, okay, every page is going to be a splash. But in a sense, it also drives you to keep wanting to know, read more because you want to turn the page because you know that every time you turn a page, it's going to be just something completely unexpected, right? It's not like trapped into like, oh, there's a sequence that's happening over 20 pages and on a subconscious level, I know that if this is gonna happen, this is gonna happen, this is gonna happen at some point. But it's just completely unexpected in the way it works like to help compel a reader to keep. Yeah. I think, it's a page turner. You know? <laughs> yeah. And I think too, like, I mean, there are pages that have, you know, multiple different images on them. And I think this is also just my default because this is the way like 10 things I see on the street or whatever that's kind of like the way things look on Instagram or something I mean I hate to say it but it's sort of like how we consume visual image or how I most often consume visual images it's like in one square especially if you're commuting from Westchester and how you consume is on a scroll. <laughs> 
for you know three hours throughout the day. Uh, uh. Um, it's interesting to me, like how you know, like everything we thought were kind of like essential to sequential art, like iconographical drawings or panels, or all this stuff. You know, like the fundamentals, but it seemed like one can take out multiple of those and it can still read like a comic. So it kind of like really fascinates me. Like one does not have to take off all those boxes. Yeah. Well, I love the, the this like distinction thing between, I, it's, I had to, I had to like re do some research to understand what's the, cause I was like, oh, I wrote a graphic memoir and I'm, but I didn't think it was comics. And now I'm like, oh no, I make comics. I don't make, cause I don't, I don't want to be like doing the, like the fancy weird thing. Like, I, you know, that's made up because people didn't want to, like grownups didn't want to read comics. Like, I don't know. There's, I feel like it's really political, the difference between, or not, but there's like some made up difference between all these different things as if they're not one, one genre, or maybe they all, I mean, I would like to hear what you guys think, the scholars. <laughs> About that. Comics. Well, it's, comics, yeah. It's all, it's all comics. <laughs> it's all comics. Yeah. It's all, it's all comics. It's all comics. Yeah. yeah. It, but, it, but you're right that there are plenty of people who want to make some of those distinctions and come up with new merged combinations, whether it's graphic novel, picto novel sort of things, illustrated. Yeah, it's marketing, or, right? Marketing, well, uh, legitimizing moves and things like that. Well, it's funny you should say that because when I was working at Beauty America, like my my editor, my publisher was like, okay, it's going to be called, we're going to call it a graphic memoir. I'm like, but wait, it's a comic book. It's a graphic memoir. They're like, it's like a, like from home or like, you know, mouse. I'm like, oh yeah, like a comic book. I'm like, no, it's a graphic memoir. Like, okay. <laughs> You can say that because you paid me in advance to do this, but I'm just gonna call it a comic book, uh, you know, like because I'm like I'm I'm old I'm old that way. Like I started reading comics in the '80s, so it's all. And I don't say it's a comic book to be like imply a certain thing or to be derogatory or anything like that. It's just that's just the language to me. It's comics. I don't see anything wrong with calling it a comic. Book. Um, so it's uh, but I definitely think, and I I, I feel like maybe this would apply to also everyone who teaches in the classroom is like I love it when my students come from a background that they like yeah I just started reading comics six months ago and then I have students who've been like I that's the only thing I ever look at is comics because that's when you truly get like people really um, like doing work that's really different and really challenging things whether it's challenging things in a really traditional way about like how you approach panels differently or challenging things in a completely new, unforeseen way because they've never read a comic before. And that's when you get like this great cohort of like, like uh, just newness, essentially, right? As opposed to like certain people feeling like, no, oh, that's not a comic, it's a comic, or vice versa. And that's, that's for me, like the joy of definitely having like so many different voices in the room, critiquing each other's work and creating work and kind of feeding off each other's work. Um, and just one little weird, weird quick thing I wanted to add was, so then, Okay, I'm sure you are. You, you're. You've read um, Nick uh, Nick Susanis. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, he's Susanis. actually mm -hmm. the external reader of my dissertation. Ah, that's that's great. So yes. let's see which book comes out first. Is the next one or yours? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't but, but Nick, I mean, for those not familiar with Nick, Nick's work is, is a, unflattening is a must read. Definitely. Yeah, Aaron, when you're done with understanding comics from the cloud, please read it flat. Exactly. Thanks, Brad. It, it, yeah, it's fantastic, right? It's like, it's just, it breaks down all those barriers and those concepts of what a comic can be or what it was or what it could be. And it's, it's really that's a way to explore that question. Well, if I could, I'm not supposed to be asking questions, but I'm very, I'm, I'm going to insert myself just for a moment because I'm struck by just to your point, GB, about the range of experiences. So both you and Aaron talk about constructing your comics at a time when it was really for you, the story you wanted to tell about your family uh, in Vietnam, or Aaron trying to, you know, get the internal out and externalize it. Um, 
and we often talk, comic scholars, about all the collaborative teamwork that's involved in building a comic, but hearing you all discuss what you, your process for these particular titles is really interesting because it sounds like you did so much of this work on your own, um, but then you talk about your editor, like you both have also referenced that other voice, the editor who comes in and makes suggestions about panels or what to call it. And so I'm curious, now that you're moving on to other texts that are more sort of self-consciously created, whether they're fiction or nonfiction, do you find yourself missing some of that initial, I don't know what you might call it, that freshness that you had when you were, and Aaron, in your case, had only read Fun Home or, you know, you thought it was a comic, but you didn't know it was, it was Mouse. It was a graphic memoir. Like now that you know the ways that people are trying to prefer to um, describe your work and market it and so forth, has that affected some of your thinking about the way you create comics now? That was a really long question too, but. <laughs> oh, I love that question. Um, my, the book I'm working on now is so hard. It is so hard to make a book that's not about me uh, because the, that's the only thing I've done, right? Is like, Commute was like, you know, the research was here. <laughs> it's just my own internal shit. Um, but the book I'm working on now, I've been researching for a year and a half. I mean, I've, I've read a, a, a lot of, of scholarly material. I've been interviewing people and writing other people's stories and writing about their trauma and their illness and disability and shame. And I'm responsible for so much. And there are so many things to think about. Um, like, how do I draw um, someone's pain or injury or illness without making a spectacle of it? Um, what is my role as the artist and illustrator who's also a white woman. Like how does my, do, how do I interact with these people? How, how am I exploiting them? How do I not exploit them? How do I, like there are just so many really difficult questions that I've been thinking about for such a long time. Um, and, and the way that it interacts with like the actual drawing on the page is again, like it's a lot of, um, I read, I read Sadia Hartman's uh, Scenes of Subjection and, and I've been thinking a lot about, you know, like how do I tell a black woman's story? Do I tell a black woman's story? Like how, how does that become a piece of this? How do I draw someone in pain without showing their pain? Um, how do I abstract it? Um, how, you know, uh, I, and there's another person in the book I'm working on who um, is, was a victim of uh, Dr. Larry Nassar, who was a child gymnast. And how do I how do I draw her so that she you you can you get the sense of the toll that this the years of abuse took and of her subsequent chronic illness. Um, without, I'm not going to draw it, you know? Um, so I've actually like worked with the different people who are spilling their souls to me for this book to think of ways that we could represent them in the abstract and also their bodies and how do, how their bodies feel, how, how they think of themselves, how they've constructed their identity and how I can visually represent that. But it's a lot of like abstracting things. Um, and then the other part of it is just for this book, there's so much more text on the page. Um, Cause my, I'm not allowed to have more pages than this. And there's three times as many words um, and I'm not doing panels. So it's a lot of, um, and then also how do I visually show the difference between my voice and somebody's and one of the, the people who, whose story is in the book and, and their voice. So there's like all of these different things to think about. There's so much more to think about than what I thought about in this book when I was just telling sort of my own story. I, I now feel this like really heavy sense of responsibility to um, other people who've entrusted me with 
you know, their story and their pain and their trauma. Um, I really struggle with it every single day. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's a really different book in that sense, but I, yeah, and it's so much harder. It's just, it's so much harder. Um, so a lot to, a lot to think about, but I've done, I've read many more comics in the, you know, since I started Commute, uh, and I've done, I've read a lot more comics theory and, um, graphic medicine and that, you know, I've, I've really tried, I've been, I've been putting in, putting in the work or trying to really, um, understand sort of my role and anyway, I'm rambling, but it, it's a great, great, great question. Can I, can I'm I, wondering if I could, yeah, I was actually going um, to send it over to GB because a, a lot of what Erin was saying made me think about GB, your work, right, and the fact that you're representing your parents' histories, yeah. and although it's a very different relationship, you know, you and your parents versus Erin um, and the people that she's talking to, you know, to what degree do those same issues like come up for you, the kind of sense of responsibility to them to represent their history to others, um, sort of like how are you going to represent what they went through? Um, when you weren't them, right? Like you didn't go through that, but you're also, you're learning about it and you're seeing how it's affected you as um, their child. Right. Well, I mean, before I answer that, a burning question I had from Aaron when hearing about that process is, it's, it's fascinating. It's the level, the degree of complication of layered storytelling and, you know, how much of you is on that page versus the people that these stories are telling is like, it's the magnitude is mind blowing. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, I, I'm curious too, like, is there a phase in the process where, sorry, Jeanette, I'm totally going to get to the TV question, but is there a phase that you'll be sharing a draft of the work with the people that the story you're sharing with? So you get their kind of their initial feedback or their reaction, or yes. like, is that that's definitely going to be part of the process? Yes. And another heroic thing, like, you're, you, 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 created something and then you're giving it to a person to read and then waiting to hear what like they think is like yeah, yeah. no I mean I, so I've I've been the people who's the, there are a couple of people who I've spoken to the most um and I've been speaking to them somewhat regularly for the last nine months um and I've really developed a relationship with them and something that I've made really clear with everyone from the beginning um, everyone, there's like three people, um, is that they are, they are, they are in charge of their stories, right? Um, and I want to make sure that they have an, every opportunity to change anything that doesn't feel right or feels mis misrepresentative or pull the plug or, I mean, it's like, it's again, it's like this huge, it's this huge responsibility. And I, I'm not trying to, I, it, it's really hard to tell somebody's story for them. Um, a, a lot of the, the way that I'm doing it in this book is I'm really letting them tell their own story um, by sort of, I'm moving the narrative along a little bit and sort of bringing in the, the medical history and the, um, the, the sort of, uh, all of the oppressive forces that make American medicine so fundamentally uh, terrible for people who are marginalized. Um, but no, I mean, I you know there was there was discussions between my agency and my um, uh, publisher in the beginning about you know having people sign consent, and I thought about it but the, the the draft i ended up getting was like you know you can't change this final project you can't back and i was just i i'm not gonna i'm not asking anybody to sign that what i've made clear to all of these people is like i'm gonna check in with you every step of the way i'm gonna show you how I'm, i mean it, i had a conversation with one woman who's in the book um and i showed her that for I, I had two pages drawn and i showed it to her and she had said previously that she was fine with her name being in the book. And then as soon as she saw her name on that page, she said, it, it's too much. I want to change it to this nickname I've had. And I, of course, I mean, I changed it everywhere that it appeared. And so it's very much like a, a working relationship where I, it's critical um, to this 
to this book that everybody has every opportunity to consent or not consent to anything that is appearing in the pages. Um, yeah, so, so every step of the way is the answer. I mean, I hope no one decides the day before I hand in the manuscript that they're no longer okay with it, but if someone wants to pull the plug, you know, that's, that's, they have that, they have the right to do that. Um, it's something I can't plan for. Um, but hey, it's critical. Uh, and that's to, to answer your question for me, like, yeah, it's apples and oranges, because for me, like, this was a family story, and my character in the story was basically you know, the character, right? Like, basically, I just stand in for the reader, and I, right, I gathered the stories through a lot of interviews and whatnot with family members, and I'd hear a story about my father that my mom told, and then I would kind of, in another conversation with an uncle, I'd bring up, oh, mom mentioned this about, about my father, and they would either say, oh yeah, I remember that, and they'd add more details, but like, no, that's not how it happened, this is how it happened. So um, there's a lot of that in a, in a parallel sense with Aaron's work, like just kind of checking in on the stories constantly. Um, but I had the luxury to be, when I started working on the project, to be like, okay, I'm gonna stop talking to all of my family now, because now I have to create a story. Um, and it was just the more strings you pull, the more, more unravel and it's just like oh what about this and what about that and at a point I just had to stop talking to my family and hearing about these things uh, because the book actually had to be made at that point and, and I think um, as far as like how characters or my family represented in the book I just call them characters um, but I did give a draft to my mother and my father to read because they're the main characters essentially. So those were the ones that I wanted uh, the quote unquote blessing the most. Um, and they were they didn't really say anything about it, honestly. Uh, they just gave it back to me and that was it. Um, and there are moments in the story where obviously not to the degree of emotional intensity that's it's, Aaron is experiencing with the work that she's currently um, tackling. But there were moments in the story where I felt like, ooh, this is gonna be really awkward when my parents see that I depicted this on the page about, you know, spousal abuse or something like that. And, um, but it came back and they didn't make any comments. And whether it's a combination because of them acknowledging like that it's just a story as opposed to being their story, um, but also I think a little bit because of the comics language isn't something that they're super, super like, like familiar with. So in a weird way, I think I got away with some stuff uh, because of the way I, I treated the comics language. Um, but yeah, so there wasn't, there wasn't any moment of them, them saying like, well, oh, actually, no, that's not true. Uh, <laughs> there was, after the book came out, and this is a little bit more lighthearted way to end this question. Uh, when the book came out, and my, the rest of my family finally read it, like my sisters, my brother. Um, up to that point, only my mother and my father read the book. But when the rest of the book came out, and my family kind of finally read it. And at the time, I was living in Williamsburg with my sister. Not with my sister, but we were just living in the same neighborhood. So we'd meet up for lunch uh, every, so, every so often. And I remember very clearly, we were eat, having lunch, and she had read my book. And... A little background, whenever my sister Lisa appears in the book as a character, she's always cussing because that's the way I remember her. Um, and at the, literally verbatim at, at lunch, she said, oh, I finally read your book. I'm like, oh, cool. What did you think? And she says, literally, I don't fucking cuss that much in real life. And I was like, uh, <laughs> I, think, I think you do. Uh, but that, that's probably the most feedback I got from the family member about their depiction in the book. Thanks for that response. That's kind of great. Um, I'm wondering, Erin, if you have gotten any responses from people who appear in your book. Um, I know towards the very end, you have that handwritten letter to John. It's, it's a very different kind of Dear John letter. Um, I'm wondering whether you've heard back from anybody that appears in the book and, and um, you know, gotten responses. Um, that's a good question. No one's ever asked me that before. Um, I mean, the answer is no, except 
um, one of the guys who, this is, this is a juicy secret, one of the guys who appears in the book um, followed me on Instagram like a few months before it came out and then a few days after it was released unfollowed me. So I think he read it, uh, but no, one, it never said anything to me. Um, and uh, other than that, no, I mean, um, yeah, no. Um, and an interesting thing about John, I mean, and, I don't know if it's interesting. Um, uh, I, I, for legal reasons, I had to change the name of everybody in the book. Um, but John is that guy's real name. It's the only name I know. I would love to be contacted by him. Um, just so I could, you know, tell him to fuck off, uh, honestly. Um, yeah, I don't know his last name. I don't know what he looked like. I, I know very little about him. Um, that was the only time I ever met him. Um, so I was like, you know, if he sues me, that's great. Like, I, I would love to know who it is. I, I don't... Um, yeah, but but no, no one else has contacted me. Yeah. Can I ask? Yeah, one? thanks for sharing that. Can I, can I ask a question? Go ahead, JD. I mean, Aaron, for for this the project, like, how did it feel when you finished it? Oh, two questions. How did it feel when you finished it and you gave it to your publisher? And how did it feel when it actually was published? Um, I was really relieved when it was done. Um, it took me like three years to, to put it all together. And, um, it's a long time to be living in, in that. Uh, so I was pretty relieved. Um, and it, it felt good when it came out, except no one really bought it is the real answer, <laughs> you know? So like, I, I mean, the real answer is that I had, you know, and this happens with most books, right? It's like, you know, I had good, uh, like star industry reviews and stuff like that. And, um, then it came out and nothing really happened. And so my response to it was, tied up in, I think, public perception or really not perception, the kind of worst thing than getting panned is like nobody caring mm -hmm. um, or sort of seeming, feeling that way, um, which is not a mistake that I'll make again. I think I, I sort of got some tough love from a, a mentor of mine who was like, who basically told me like, you make the thing you make the best thing that you can and then when it comes out you have to let go you have to become unattached because what it does out there is none of my business like it is none of my business um and i i'm trying to adopt that with this this next book i'm working on too which you know i want to make the best thing that i can make and then let go of it and you know it's i don't make the, the graphic you know not the comics that i make are certainly not for everyone um, it's, the, the new book is not for, I don't know who wants to read, I don't, I don't know that I really want to read books about pain and trauma all day. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't know, but, but there are, you know, women who have reached out to me and said, like, thank you for writing this book, especially other sober alcoholic women. Um, and I just say that because I know a lot of alcoholic women who've also, I mean, it's, I think it just, it, it makes sense to me that uh, women who drink a lot and black out a lot and are in CD bars a lot have situations that come up similar to mine, although other women do too. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, men have reached out saying, I, I understand something about this experience more than I did before and that's, and that's amazing. So, so those are the gifts, but yeah, I think like as, as putting something so private out there and then, and then having that be so tied up with like sales or something that that's what really fucked me up. Um, but I was really glad when it was done. Yeah. Cause there's, 
I mean, for for people, I mean, there's that period, right, where you finish the project, which has been so emotionally draining, like in your situation for three years of your life, you actually finish it and you hand it off. And then there's, at least for me, like there was another eight months before it actually was released in the world. And like that eight months was like weird <laughs> because it's like, oh, I'm done. Oh, yeah. I'm done. <laughs> but it's also kind of like the best part or for maybe at least it was for me. I'm like a self-obsessed daydreamer. And so those were like the eight months of infinite possibility where I sort of felt like, well, who knows, you know, maybe I'll win an award. Maybe I was so yeah. great, you know, like, and then, then there's sort of like, it, it builds and builds. And then you have this like great opening night because all your friends come and then, um, it just, you know, <laughs> just sort of like, uh, like, oh wait, I made a rape comic. Like, oh, not everybody's cup of tea. Um, so if I if I could uh, just interrupt to ask, and then I think we'll have to start um, wrapping up in a few minutes to this question of the responses that you receive. Uh, both of you have done the comics workshops with Believer Magazine, and Aaron, I remember there was a moment at the start of yours where you, I guess, you must have looked at the number of participants in the room, and you sort of were like, "Wow." This is, I think you made a comment about it being more people than you had ever spoken to at one time for that kind of thing. And I, I uh, Kay and I, have, we uh, attend many of those workshops and there are hundreds and hundreds of people, GB, yours, or I was with, at yours as well, hundreds of people attending these workshops. I wonder if um, you both might be interested in commenting on or the responsiveness to people wanting to spend their Friday nights drawing comics with you now, thanks to COVID. And, and some of them are about difficult topics about drawing body types and feelings the way that you discussed, Aaron, um, during your workshop. So I'm curious about, do you think that there's something happening in this moment? Or maybe we could have been doing these comic workshops all the time before COVID. And this is just this wonderful moment where these things are coming out. And I, and actually, they were doing workshops, I think, before COVID as well. But maybe I wasn't aware of them happening. So back to back like this. Um, but any thoughts about the reception that you're, the responses that you're getting from activities like that during this time? Oh, uh, yeah, no, thanks, Ben. Uh, it was great, you know, I, not to sound cliche or whatever, but I grew up with comics in an age where comics, I didn't go to school for comics, they weren't, they weren't even offered in my, my, my college program, and if you told them that you liked in comics, you'd be laughed at. So for me, like, uh, yeah, the, the the possibility of just being, like, spending a Friday night with a bunch of strangers just playing some sequential art games and dueling is it's 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 a real joy. Absolutely. Fantastic. And I do think it is a at least in my experience, a direct result of what's going on right now. Um, because I mean just with my day job and it's up so my I'm a graphic designer by day. Um, and as of March, we've all been working remote from home since then. So there's definitely been a lot of adjustments in how we communicate and interact with each other. And there's been a lot of pluses too in how we communicate and interact. And collaborate together. And I think the believer thing is awesome. And I think it's definitely like a byproduct of what's going on right now. And I would hope as we as we discover whatever the next normal is, um, that it will continue because it's just another way that we can connect with people who can't obviously like be physically in the same place as these people. Um, doing it. So yeah, it's, it's awesome. I really love, I really love this thing. Yeah, I have, there are so many things I want to say about this. I mean, first of all, shout out to Kristen Radke, who organized these and organized them into like hyper gear when COVID hit. Um, I think it's, I think it's a really brilliant move because uh, nobody's going out on Friday night. Um, or if you're like me and you have a young kid, you never <laughs> went out on Friday night anyway. Um, so, uh, no, I, I think they're awesome. I was shocked. I mean, mine didn't have hundreds of people. Mine had, you know, like 145 or something, but like literally 
you know, when I do a panel, it's like, you know, there's like six people in the room. So um, it's awesome. It was awesome. I was like, and then, and then there were just, people just did such amazing work, especially there were all these kids, um, like families drawing together. And I, I loved, I loved seeing that. Um, what a, what a brilliant thing to do together as a family. I mean, um, I gave these sort of horrific prompts about like drawing how anxiety feels in the body and yourself as a monster and all this stuff. And um, I actually got to like go talk to my daughter when I was done in the other room and see her drawings. And she, you know, I learned things about her by looking at her drawings. Um, so for families that aren't super artsy and always doodling together, I think it's such a great opportunity um, to sort of do some art therapy or whatever together and, and learn a little bit. Um, and I also just think that, I think comics are kind of having a moment. I think comics are super cool and awesome, though I'm biased, and there's, like, especially now, there's just so much great work. And I think people are, again, like, with, with the way that social media operates and the way that we're just used to looking at things all the time, like, we're becoming really visual. Um, and seeing words and images together, I think, makes total sense to people, I think. Um, people are in, in general, unfortunately, aren't reading a lot of books and, uh, you know, I, it's, it's nice when there are pictures. I, I don't know. I like both, but pictures are nice. Pictures are nice. Pictures are nice. That should be the name of this panel. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> on that note, I wanted to, um, help to bring this to a close by asking uh, each of you, starting with our scholars, what you're working on now. We have heard a little bit of this uh, during the course of the conversation, uh, but maybe we can start with Kay to find out what's, what's current or what's next for you. Right, so um, I agree with the fact that comics are having a moment because somehow I convinced my dissertation committee, I'm doing a PhD, so I, um, I convinced them to let me draw my dissertation and I, I'm really grateful to Nick and to Ebony Flowers who did it first because I had them like as frames of reference. I'm like, okay, look, they did it. So this can be done. Can I please do it? And they were like, yes, go ahead. So that's what I'm currently working on now. Um, it's really a mixed bag project, but it's mostly ethnographic. And I kind of like share some of Erin's struggle with um, representation because I started writing about um, a racism against Asians in the US in the light of COVID-19, but I realized that I couldn't write about it um, without also kind of like addressing the anti-Black racism that Asians have in their own communities. So um, I felt like it was really important to write about, but I also like kind of constantly doubted, like I'm kind of like doubting myself as far as representation is concerned. I'm like, am I doing this right? Am I just co-opting voices here? and how to represent pain without, you know, like kind of, like you said, making a spectacle of it. So yeah, I'm kind of like struggling with that at the moment, but I'm still really kind of um, grateful to be able to do this in a visual format because I feel like, um, I don't know if I just think visually or if it's the subject matter, but I feel like this could have been like quite impossible to write just in like textual form. So that's what I'm doing, but it's also taking a, since it's not, so it's uh, current chapter is, is about COVID-19. So it means like I'm reading news like every day for hours and hours, which means like I'm really tired, like I'm exhausted emotionally. So I am also doing this side project, which is, which is like a young adult graphic narrative uh, about um, two girls. And um, it's, it's, it's transnational, it's queer, it's really fun. So yeah, that's my little side project that kind of like brings me joy in this uncertain times. And yeah, that's about it. Uh, so my work these days um, and for the past few years actually has been about finding ways to incorporate theories and methods from visual studies into how we look at and think about comics. Um, I'm currently working on two articles that I'm hoping to finish this fall. One of them um, is in part about uh, GVs of uh, Vietnam America. What I'm doing is I'm trying to find um, theories of drawing from art history and sort of bring them in into how we talk about uh, drawing strategies. I'm comparing and contrasting Vietnam America and uh, tea leaves the best we could do. And the other thing that I'm working on this fall, any minute now I'm gonna be starting, is um, a piece about Linda Berry's work, her more recent work on you know how to draw comics, syllabus, um, her ideas about the theory of the image. 
and I'm wanting to juxtapose her work with um, existing theories in visual studies, but also make an argument that her work is in fact a form of visual studies theory. Uh, so both of these projects will be part of that um, On the Horizon second book someday that I will finish um, about visual studies, comic studies, and Asian American studies. GB. Okay. <laughs> um, we're strictly talking about comics, right? No, it could be whatever, whatever you're working on. Uh, no, um, it's for comics. I work in The Believer, calls The Believer. <laughs> yeah, that's the, the Believer that's called The Believer. I remember when, <laughs> that's so funny. I remember turning a draft to Kristen about that. And her first reaction was like, it's called The Believer? I'm like, yeah, that's, that's still the <laughs> <laughs> it's a little controlling, I think, for for Chris to be on board with that title. Uh, so, uh, projects. I have a, a larger project that has been going through some spurts for the last year and a half. That's an immigrant project. It's actually um, it's an anthology uh, intentionally, but. But it's it's kind of going through some issues. It was actually had some really good momentum until COVID hit, and suddenly the opportunity to be in a room and interview and talk to people in person kind of uh, kind of dropped off. Like so, it's still kind of in a very nebulous form right now. Uh, I'm also working also in the very proto stages is uh, a Vietnamese cookbook essentially uh, because it's an excuse for me to actually put to print a lot of the stories from Vietnam America that didn't actually make it into Vietnam America, um, but to do it in a context along the lines of like the, uh, the cookbooks that were released by Tens the comic cookbooks that were released by Tensu Press. Um, and then of course I do a semi-weekly um, comic strip on my, my Instagram account, which was born because of actually the immigration project kind of hitting the brakes, and then I realized, well, I still need to make comics to basically keep those skills sharp, and that kind of evolved into a bit something once or twice weekly, just in some um, spontaneous uh, personal comments about things that are going on. Um, yeah, nothing with a hard due date, um, but we'll see what the the rest of. Well, I'm writing off 2020. 2020, I'm just writing off it. It's, I think for a lot of us, maybe we're all writing off 2020. But hopefully in 2021, I'll have actually more concrete details about these projects. Uh, so, but, and, uh, and on the side raising the kids. And a day job. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I already spoke a lot about the book I'm working on. Um, I just finished up a piece for um, a McSweeney's book um, called Access about reproductive. Uh, access um, that comes out next year or maybe it's the year after um, and um, my comic is about how white women specifically um, create uh, a lack of or how white women obstruct reproductive justice and access for black women, um, how, how, how white women have done that historically um, and, and currently um, by centering the discussion on sort of birth control or abortion access um, when, for example, like birth control was really problematic for, for black women um, because of sort of neo-Malthusian ideas of eugenics and, and sort of uh, um, trying to diminish black reproduction at a time when there was this massive concern that um, there weren't enough white people around. Um, so I just finished up that. I'm, I'm doing some edits on that. And then I, am, yeah, I'm working on this book. And then I'm trying to figure out how I'm supposed to make a living uh, doing comics. I actually had a really funny conversation with, with um, Kay because uh, she 
she she reached out to me on on Twitter and and we had this this funny Zoom conversation where she was like, oh, you make comics and you publish comics, like that's so cool. And I was like, wait, you're doing a PhD and you're doing comics scholarship, that's so cool. Because I applied for like seven doctoral programs um, last year and I got into so many of them at zero, zero. I got accepted zero places. Um, so I thought I would be doing that this fall, but it turns out I just have to keep making comics instead. And then like everyone who, else that I know who makes comics, um, I have to <laughs> figure out how to make a living, um, which I'm sure GV is familiar with since he's doing graphic design, which is what my husband does. Um, he works for American Eagle. Oh, really? Yeah, doing gra like accessories design. Um, That's hilarious. I, yeah, I, I mean, this is what artists do, right? And, well, and I, I, I was working. I do apparel graphics for the Navy. That's my thing. Yeah, I, I do that. Um, but yeah, I worked, you know, like you said in the intro, I worked for in cancer research for 10 years and I, I ended up leaving my job about a year ago um, because I was, um, anyway, it's a long story, but uh, so I don't know what I'm doing with my life. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's really, yeah, I, I really, uh, I enjoy hearing how other cartoonists create work because uh, it allows me to not be so brutal on myself. <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 you know, whether it takes a year, whether it takes three years, whether it takes 10 years, the work is going to be created. If it right. Really, it's just like, well, what's the balance in that? Right? What's the balance of like raising your, your, your daughter or your child? Yes. And I related so much to your comic in The Believer. I'm sorry, I know we're going over and we're getting off topic, but but GB, I related so much to your comic in The Believer because all those years that I was working in cancer research, right? I was working at this startup for the last three years that I was doing that in 50 hours a week, right? And then I had by the time I left, I had two books and contracts. So I worked nights, days, weekends. That's how I did it. I worked 70, 80 hours a week. And the reason I ended up leaving my job is because I couldn't be in the same room with my daughter anymore without her like violently attacking me because she had such um, separation anxiety. I ended up like quitting my job and like going, taking her to intensive therapy. And like, I had to have this, this is getting so personal, but I, I basically had to, completely uproot my life in order to like get get to have a relationship with my child because I was just all I did was was work and and um and now I'm in the other part of it which is that I have this great relationship with my daughter that I worked so hard for um and I also have no idea how I'm gonna make money <laughs> yeah. it's like, why isn't there like a nice medium in between this is no, like there isn't oh. <laughs> I would also um, love to hear what, what you're working on, Kiana. Yeah. Oh, thank you for that question. I mean, I am uh, in the middle of doing ICAF. I'm editor of Inks, the Journal of the Comic Study Society, and I'm editing a book um, on race and early American comics, uh, more golden age comics with a terrific group of contributors. So that's in the works right now in addition to my two kids. So I can definitely relate to, to the struggle of uh, the nights and weekends. Um, so yeah, that's what I have. That's what I have going on. And but we are all deeply appreciative of the time that you all can find to make comics. So we, we hope that you are able to keep doing more of that. Um, and I think that's it for our panel. Thank you all so much. Appreciate you joining this conversation, Jeanette, Kay, GV, and Aaron. Um, for those who are watching, make sure to check out the links in the bio for, um, for their books. Um, and thanks again, everyone. Thank you. And thank you, Kiana. And also thank you to SPX and to ICAF for bringing us all together. This has been a real pleasure. It's been so much fun um, and a great break from uh, class prep. That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs>